All right, how's it we been? Uh, I've slept for eight hours, two nights in a row. Wow. Whoa. For the first time in a long time. Um, it's been a phenomenal week here in Nashville. I'm uh, very sad that they're moving it to Vegas because I think Nashville delivered the relief from three years in Miami that, that Bitcoin culture has been hungry for. Um, so I think it was a, a resounding success. You know. A little bit excited about Vegas. Oh, I'm definitely excited about Vegas. <laughs> so, <laughs> Clean Sparks headquarters is in Vegas, right? So we'll be able to we'll be able to bring like the entire team, um, which will be a lot of fun. You, you're going to need to explain that because people know of you as Grid. It's the first time you're not in Grid merch. I know. Well, so I exactly. Typically, I'm ne I'm never not branded, um, and so I figured for your episode we'd wear a Real Bedford shirt. Um, but uh, I'm I'm thrilled to share again with you guys that uh grid was acquired by clean spark last month congratulations thank you um it's the culmination of a lot of work i've been at it for for six years um and you know the trend in mining the the trajectory is is bigger is better um and so you know we got to know their management team a few months ago we went through you know all the process and all the negotiation the legal and everything um and we all kind of agreed this is exactly the right fit um for a number of reasons one is that you know during the years that i've been at grid we've always prioritized the state of tennessee getting access to a lot of power here building incredible relationships with the different utilities that serve the state and the region um Clean Sparks operations are in Georgia and Mississippi and soon to be Wyoming. So Tennessee sits right in between Mississippi and Georgia. So it's an opportunity to get sort of the whole southeast region covered and mining um, all over, you know, all over the place. So there was a geographical fit, there was a talent fit where, you know, we've we've always sort of been operators first, um, talking on podcast second. And so I think that you know, our team is going to fold into theirs really nicely. They have a history of doing acquisitions, but those historically have been around buying sites. Um, we're sort of the first time that they've also said, hey, there are sites, but there's also a team. And so the combination of talent's awesome. <laughs> they bought me. They bought this. Just say it. <laughs> I am thrilled at the opportunity to go out and talk on the Peter McCormick show about – everything we're working on at clean spark for years to come all we want is harry we can buy a grid for harry what's the combined uh hash rate you got now uh our hash rate um so we're running about 70 megawatts we're in the process of building another 85 um they're running over 20 x a hash and so you know i'm not sure exactly the hash rate numbers that our full utilization on our side will represent but they're committed to building 400 megawatts in the state of Tennessee by the end of 26. Wow. And so we're going to be a very large percentage of, of their operating fleet at that point. And um, why is the focus on Tennessee? Um, I think this past week was kind of a showcase for some of why Tennessee is Bitcoin country. Um, just at the park, we had a panel on Friday um, that included Governor Lee. Haggerty. Senator Haggerty. Yeah. And Jeff Lyash, the CEO of TVA. And those are three pretty important people. We had Secret Service everywhere. Um, and they all talked about what Bitcoin mining means for TVA, the energy system, what it means for the Tennessee state economy. Um, and so these are folks who see the future the way we do and want to work in partnership with private enterprise to continue to invest in the power system, to continue to use what Bitcoin mining does best, which is flexible load. Uh, in order to continue to expand the economy here, significantly improve the reliability of the grid that's already a national leader, um, and kind of carry Tennessee into the future, both with Bitcoin, but also on the energy side. So I was speaking to Rod just before we recorded, and I didn't quite understand how big a deal Jeff Lyash is. Do you want to kind of put some perspective on how like, influential he is? Yeah, I mean, Jeff Lyash is like the Bill Gates of electricity, basically. Um, he... First of all, he's a nuclear engineer, so he's the only utility executive who's actually holds the license to operate nuclear plants. Um, so he's also a big super nerd, 
like me. So we, we get along immediately. But um, Tennessee runs somewhere between 33 and 35 gigawatts of power across seven states. Um, he won't like me saying this, but he's the highest paid federal employee in the country. And Tennessee is... How much is he on? No, don't do that. It's a, is it a public figure anyway? It's a, it's a public figure, but you can Google it. <laughs> Google it, don't you? Um, and, you know, just the, the history that TVA has, it's a 90-year-old federal agency that was established as part of the New Deal. Um, Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> choose rich. Choose, choose rich. Um, you know, so, so the, the Tennessee Valley Authority is like one of the incredible accomplishments of the federal government. I know we come on and talk about Bitcoin and mm -hmm. are skeptical of government, but, um, but the Tennessee Valley Authority is kind of government at its best where they're operating one of the highest uptime, highest availability, lowest cost power systems in America. Um, I see it as sort of like the complete counter, are you aware of horseshoe theory? Which is like the two things that are furthest apart are actually very close together. So you look at the shape of a horseshoe. Yep. The two the two tips on the horseshoe are actually the furthest apart from each other by distance, but they are very close to each other when you look at them. So I see ERCOT and TVA as sort of the two points on the horseshoe where those are the two places that I think are going to be the most attractive to miners. If we fast forward a few years, it's going to be the largest installed bases of hash rate in the country. Are they, are they using it for flexible load here? Absolutely. Okay, and so the idea is to continue to grow that. How does that work, though? Because people often talk about ERCOT as being its own independent grid. Yes. So how does it work here? How does it work when it's like a wider grid that covers multiple states? Yeah, so the the differentiation that ERCOT needs to have is basically like there's an open market for buying and selling the power, and it's not FERC-regulated. So FERC is... FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And they're typically the person who licenses all of the power plants and the energy interconnection and the way that the patchwork of, of non-Texas grids tie to each other. Um, so ERCOT sits apart from that and they run what's called a deregulated market. Um, and they have an open market for power and they have an open market for licensing new generation. Tennessee is about the, and TVA, is about the furthest opposite of that, where there are um, published tariffs. So there's no open market for power in TVA. You get pushed into a rate class. That's basically just a formula. Um, what they've done that's so compelling, at least for, for us and from my perspective, is that they've overlaid these really exciting interruptible programs. So they're adding another formula on top of the first one, which basically says... We know how much flexibility we need across the year. We're going to tap you, the Bitcoin miner, as the source of that flexibility. And there are significant economic incentives to participate in that flexibility that we're happy to pay you every month. Where's their flexible load coming from at the moment? Um, manufacturing, large scale. So I think you need to be over five megawatts to even to enroll in the program. Maybe it's one megawatt to enroll in the program. And keep in mind, in like old world utility land, a one megawatt or a five megawatt customer is massive, right? It just so happens that Bitcoin mining 10X is that, um, like Bitcoin 10X is everything. And uh, and so, you know, we're just sort of the biggest, best versions of businesses that are, that are designed to enroll in this type of program. But you'll see enrollment either with a smaller percentage of load or with a smaller load, but, it, but this program is available to everybody. Amazing, amazing. So t Tennessee is like snapping on the heels of texas um i think foundry did a it was either foundry or river somebody did a research piece on like where's the hash rate um and actually georgia is ahead of texas i think really which it was very surprising to me but because texas gets a lot of headlines but at clean spark we have a lot of hash rate deployed in georgia as well um and I know Core has operations there, and and others do as well. So is I Georgia think, a red state? Georgia is a purple state. Okay. Red governor, blue senators. Okay, interesting. Right now, yeah, interesting. Um, is know, that but, a swing state? Um, depends on the race. It it has been the. I mean, the last two election, two elections ago, it went for Trump, and last election it went for Biden by a na very narrow margin. So I'd say it's. Swingy. Is that where Trump phoned them up and said, hey, man, find me some votes? I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> Your lack of comment is conviction. 
<laughs> We're careful with the C word these days. Okay, fair, fair. Uh, the main stories I hear about is the massive expansion of um, hash rate here in, in the US. Mm-hmm. Uh, massive expansion of the public miners. Then occasionally you'll hear a story like Marathon Wood doing something out in... Uh, in the Middle East, and obviously our sponsors, Iron, do a lot up in Canada. But is the is the is the most distinct, fast, rapid growth here in the U.S. And are are we at any point worried about how much hash rate is here? Because there was a time where people were like, well, there's too much hash rate in China. Um, I th- do we know the percentage? Uh, I don't know the percentages, um, but I think that you know ultimately there's just this global thing that's happening, which is that we all need to produce more electricity. We need to do that in the US for sort of highly developed use cases, but we need to do it everywhere for a varying, you know, diversity of use cases. If you're, you know, if you're in India, your manufacturing sector is growing incredibly quickly and India is building a huge amount of electric generation. I think I read the, um, ARC actually did a really good generate energy generation report today. Um, where I think they said China's growing like 5.6% annually um, on all of their generation basis on a compounded on a compounded rate. So that's obviously a huge amount of electricity each year that they put onto their system. So I think that, you know, the trend that I'm following more closely than where's the hash rate is where's the new reactor, where's the new power plant. Mm -hmm. Um, And that trend is more compelling to me to say that, you know, everybody's in a race to generate more electrons. And that means that everybody's in a race to target the best buyers of electricity in the world, which means that the competition for our expansion dollars is going to be robust, which means that decentralization is, is pretty secure. Uh, I was amazed to see that. Danny just up. pulled up the chart, 38% in the USA, but 21% in China. And this mm-hmm. is what it's like banned. Last year, but... <laughs> and, I, and I think these... Ireland, 2%, representing the Great British Isle. We've got the UK has a very small share I mean, of mining, I, 0.1%. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, Ireland would be offended if you said that. Yes. Because they're an independent country. They are an independent country. Yes. Um, oh, go on, Ireland. Why is Ireland able to do it when the rest of... I do not know the answer Because to that. they're an independent country. <laughs> yeah, but they're not. They're part of the EU socialist super state. I, uh, I don't expect the EU to catch up. No. In terms of Bitcoin mining. But electricity is expensive in Europe. That's the thing. So, very much. Yeah. Is that good, all? Ireland's kind of like a bit of a tech hub, but I didn't know there yeah, was it is. very much Bitcoin mining going they on They pissed off all of Europe by breaking tax, European harmonized tax laws by offering t- incentives for Apple, Facebook, Twitter, everyone to go there. Do you know all about this? I'm aware. Do you know, do you know about the massive fine? I'm aware of the fine. I'm aware of just sort of the, the offshoring of cash. Mm-hmm. that all of the large-scale technology companies did. But you know the fine was a fine that they would receive, not pay? No. Yeah, so the fine was they would fine the tech companies, and the tech companies, so the tech companies paid the right tax to Ireland because Ireland gave them tax breaks. Um, and Ireland, they, 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 they were like, we don't want the fine. Please don't pay these billions of dollars to us because they want the jobs God. in the country. I can't remember what it was. Apple was like billions. I'm sure. Yeah. Apple's sitting on a quarter trillion dollars in cash. So we, buy Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. Melton, quarter trillion dollars. So is this the right time for consolidation? Should we expect more of it? Um, you know, like I, I liken it very much to the like the oil and gas kind of wildcat days where everybody's both a buyer and a seller. Everybody's sniffing around. You know, the bankers aren't sleeping. Um so I think there's going to be a lot more activity, but I'm not sure how many folks are going to be able to actually get to deals um, or if people are going to have to really get pushed to the brink before they're willing to make a deal. Because I think everybody everybody who's selling thinks their price is higher than everybody who's buying is potentially willing to pay. Um, no, but look, Riot just bought uh, another company last week in Kentucky. Um, our deal was obviously a few weeks before that. So I think there's going to be, um, you know, a pretty significant continuing consolidation of the big middle. Uh, and then I think mining is going to become a very large scale business or a very mom and pop style business. I think there's like a bunch of one, five, 20 megawatt sites that are just owned by high net worth people or small businesses. And those are going to be incredibly productive for a long time to come. Um, 
and that's going to aid decentralization. That's going to aid geographic diversity, all those different things. But ultimately, the economies of scale that you get at the large end of things is really, really, really compelling. It's what motivated us um, in order, you know, to to get really excited about the deal. But um, I still think that if you're able to get truly differentiated power, the gridless computes of the world, the flared gas operators of the world, the upstream datas of the world, like th those style, smaller scale projects are going to be incredibly lucrative over time. What do you think of the uh, increased centralization though with these pubcos merging? Um, it's sort of always been my perspective on the pubco angle is that, yes, there's a lot of hash rate under one corporate umbrella, but a public company is owned by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of shareholders. And we're governed by the most transparent, high value property rights in the world here in the US. Um, and so on the one hand, the hash rate is relatively centralized, but the ownership of that hash rate is quite decentralized when you think about the full list of shareholders. Mm -hmm. hmm. All right. We're going to be talking about Bitcoin podcast in level two soon. Podcasting level two? <laughs> Podcasting level two. I love it. But uh, we're here to talk to you about Bitcoin level two. So bear in mind, I know nothing of this. Danny's just told me about this. What is, what is your... So I, I said this in January when we hosted the Nashville Energy and Mining Summit here is that, and that was pre-having, but I really believe that this past having represents a fork in the road for Bitcoin mining, where everything pre 3.125 subsidy was Bitcoin mining level one, maybe some level zero, right? Home mining, laptop mining, like that was level zero. It was easy. All you had to do was know about mining and you could make a ton of money, uh, or at least in forward. A ton of Bitcoin. A ton of Bitcoin. Forward appreciation terms, like people mined 50 Bitcoin in a block. Um, I was uh, I was at lunch with, um, with a Canadian Bitcoiner who was around at that period of time. And he was like, oh yeah, like, you know, I plugged in some Butterfly lab stuff. We were making three Bitcoin a day. I was like, holy shit. Yeah. Um, you need a lot of hash rate to make three Bitcoin a day now. Uh, and so there was sort of that, that, that level zero was like, you could make a bunch of Bitcoin in your house. Level one was really the S9 until the 3.125 halving. The ASICs, the ASIC, the first the, phase the, the of ASIC. The first ASIC era. Yeah. Um, and what that meant was like, you were just purely in a Bitcoin mining land, right? You didn't have to worry about, about energy other than just trying to buy it cheap. Um, you didn't have to worry about site design other than you got to kind of keep it cool. And, and so it was sort of a very formulaic, relatively plug and play and widely well understood business model. Um, that was level one. And now with the having that just happened and margins are tight, you know, yes, we're back near all time highs in Bitcoin price. We're not near all-time highs in hash price. We're still, you know, $50 hash price. We're near all-time lows. We're near all-time lows. And so, one, that's normal. That's not unexpected, right? We're in a commodity production business, which trends towards tighter margins over time, which rewards scale, operational excellence, and, techn and technological innovation. That's what a tighter margin business rewards, and that's what the right area of investment is going to continue to be. Execution, technology, scale. Um, and so as we enter level two, we're seeing a lot of folks take different approaches. I think the mining AI overlap is a significant level two strategy. I think continuing to double down on sophistication around power market interaction, that's a level two strategy. I think the switch from air cooled as sort of the highest ROI activity towards a more immersion first uh, de design approach that's a level two strategy. I think international expansion and diversification, that's a level two strategy. Um, and then, and then you know, all of the sort of adjacent business models that start to get bolted on, like those are starting to become, you know, a more interesting level two strategy as well. So I, I'm starting to see everybody take on level two thinking. Some of them are getting it right. Some of them are getting it wrong. Some of them are throwing stuff at the wall. But ultimately, there's a, a you know, passive and implicit understanding that 
what we did to make money as Bitcoin miners, to make Bitcoin on a profitable basis as Bitcoin miners over the last six, seven, eight years, those approaches are now changing. The size and scale of the leading operators is changing. You know, last time we talked, Iron was probably a $500 million company. Now they're sniffing $2 billion. CleanSpark, when they started mining in you know, 2019, 2020, they were a couple hundred million dollar company. Now they're a $4 billion company. So the scale and size of these leading operators um, has dramatically changed. And so there needs to be a deep understanding, both on the part of shareholders, but also on the part of us operators, is that what got us here is not going to be what gets us there. Yeah, I think this level two thing is quite interesting, especially in the way you define it. Because to me, it's two things. One, it's a massive maturing of the market, massive maturing of the market. But also, I think it um, taps into a wider thing that we've often talk about is that Bitcoin getting out of the niche. And that isn't just in mining, it's everywhere. You know, eventually, we don't want to be those nerds over there you know, having their nerd meetups, we doing need, everything in the niche. We need our Zuckerberg glow up. Yeah, it's, 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 it's being part of everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's being part of everything. I mean, yeah, it actually has some alignment with what we're doing with the podcast, what we did with the event where it wasn't called the Bedford Bitcoin Conference. And what I'm seeing everywhere, it's like Bitcoin needs to become part of everything so it isn't that like, bunch of weird nerds in the corner having their discussion. It is just it's part of everything. It's a, it's a natural part of a, uh, a, a Wall Street investor's portfolio. It's a part of a, you know, a hedge strategy. It just needs to be part of everything. It's a part of, you know, for you and I and Danny, it's probably part of everything we do. When I pay for something, am I going to pay with Bitcoin, fiat, or my card? What am I going to do? It's just, we just make those choices. And I think that's the whole maturing of what Bitcoin is. It shows where we've come to. So before you got in here, Danny, Danny and I were talking a little bit about this. We're, what I think we're in the middle of is Bitcoin puberty. We're not, yes. we're not kids anymore. We're not adults yet. But like each morning we wake up and we might have grown like three inches overnight. Yeah. And so we're in this sort of leaps and bounds growth phase where we're kind of awkward. Our voice kind of cracks some of the time. Yeah. We're not sure what the smells and sights look like, but but it's happening, right? And we can start to see the fully mature version emerging but we also need to be stay humble and stack sats and and recognize that we're not there yet but we need to be very deliberate about how we grow through this phase yeah and i would say signal wise just the fact that donald trump was at the conference whatever you think of him whatever you think of what he said the fact that he is there shows that we are there there's a you know it's an it's a maybe overused steve jobs quote but like it's at the end of you know the, the crazy one speech he says but about the only thing you can't do is ignore them and so i think bitcoin has become an unignorable piece of the financial pie part of the social pie um and part of sort of the cultural landscape that we find ourselves in two out of the three highest polling presidential nominees were at the bitcoin conference the other one kind of wanted to come i think I mean, like any like any cool table, everybody wants to sit there. Well, so the the just following that on Twitter is kind of interesting as well. I mean, uh, Cameron Tyler Winklefoss have been tweeting out about this. Like, <laughs> I mean, the truth is, Kamala is a very easy play right now. Yeah, she goes and frees Ross, job one done. <laughs> okay, totally. she goes and sacks Gary Gensler, job two done, and she puts Elizabeth Warren in her place, which maybe she can't do because we don't know how the corridors of power work. But she has some very easy wins right now. They're super easy wins. You know, Donald Trump has said what his playbook is. Yeah. He's, she can watch a speech and see what we cheered for. Sat Gary again like, woohoo. He, he said it again because of that. You know, the, the, you can see how our industry has been attacked unfairly through the courts, through the media. I mean, it's, it's whether she gets it or she's just going to pander. Um, you can't get rid of us. No, oh, you definitely can't get rid of us. We're, you know, we're like like any single issue. You kind of have to take a position, and we are a very uh, motivatable voting block, right? We, you know, and and I think it cuts both ways. But like, I think that the Bitcoin industry is kind of a cheap date right now because we only need a little bit of love. 
we've been we've been cast aside and treated horribly and laughed at and talked down to for so long that the moment that we get a little bit of daylight, we're all in and all excited. We're like a we're like a puppy. Yeah. You keep kicking us. <laughs> I still love you. Yeah, it it it's it's true, and and that's because I think there's a fundamental optimism to Bitcoiners, even if we're a little crazy and yell a little bit. But but what we have because we have Bitcoin is we have a, a belief that the future can be better than the past, and we're willing to do whatever it takes to realize that better future on the back of a better asset. Yeah, and we offer an alternative narrative to everything else being kind of shit. Like as you look around in society, politics, fine, and everywhere you look, things things are breaking. Like you can you can see you can see it with your own eyes. You can feel it with the businesses you run. You see everything around you breaking. You see people breaking. Yeah, we're not breaking. We're growing and we're getting stronger. So what is it about us? What is it about the nature of Bitcoin and Bitcoiners that in a time where everything's breaking, we're kind of doing the opposite? Uh this is a great Ayn Rand moment for us because in the fountainhead you know the the one of the core ideas is you can't control a happy person so you need to demoralize people in order to control them and bitcoiners can't be controlled because we're, we're not demoralized no we're happy we're happy motivated and winning and excited to continue to lay down the track in front of the railroad train that we're riding on yeah man let's talk about some of this maturing as well Let's talk about the AI thing. Obviously, we fully aware again uh, for transparency. Ira and our sponsor uh, have been, I don't know if they are the leader in trying to integrate AI and Bitcoin, but they've certainly been the ones that we've seen be most noisy about. And we've learned a lot about it with it. It's super interesting. And by the way, another, an industry that isn't attacked in the way that Bitcoin is, but does have a huge and accelerating uh, desire for more power. We like the electrons. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the AI thing is super interesting. I think on the one hand, it looks a lot to me like the 1999, 2000, 2001 period where there was a massive overinvestment in fiber and all of this fiber was laid, you know, and, and, you know, the joke was that it's dark fiber cause it hasn't been lit up yet. And a lot of the businesses that laid it didn't work out. And so I think, but but wake up 20 years later and there's a huge, huge, huge industry for connectivity and, you know, Wi-Fi and, and um, the ability to access the internet globally. So, you know, the question is, is like, are they going to learn the lessons of that period of time where everybody basically overinvested and went bankrupt? Or are they going to overinvest but not so much that they fall off, but that they're able to catch what we we think is a significant wave. Um, the other kind of concept from that period of time is that the 2001, you know, NASDAQ, you know, tech bubble crash, those were all great ideas. And it just took somewhere between seven and 15 years for them to be realized as enormous businesses. But like, and people joke about pets.com as like this huge blow up. You know what's a huge business is Chewy. You know what they do? They sell pet stuff on the internet. Exactly what Pets.com did. Oh, uh, look, <clears throat> some of them came too early because the the connectivity was slow. Yep. I don't know if you had dial up. You remember those times? I remember. 56. Oh, I remember the sound. Yeah. Yeah. I had fifty six, and it, you would wait for an image to load slowly, mm -hmm. and so. Yeah, some of these built, I mean, the boo.com was a big one in the UK. It was a fashion website built in Flash. Do you remember Flash? The like animated yeah, websites. Yeah, yeah. And that you could try clothes on and you know, superimpose yourself. It just everything took too long to load. Yeah. So they had the, they had the issue. The customers weren't there. Not everyone had got their AOL disk and booted it up. Exactly. And it also had become a fabric of everything you do every day. Like you, you knew you could buy online, we we'll still go to the shops. The biggest difference this cycle than in that period of time is that. It wasn't the companies with the massive war chests that were deploying, right? So then it wasn't, you know, I forget what the biggest company in the world was at the time, but like GE and Exxon, yeah. like those were the biggest companies if you looked at like the Dow. They weren't the ones investing in fiber. They were the ones seeing if it was all going to work out and that the companies that invested were venture backed or private equity backed and, and you know, were sort of much more at risk. Today, 
Biggest companies in the world are Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft. Those are also the companies making these huge bets, and they're doing so because they have incredible balance sheet strength. And so their ability to withstand a couple of AI cycles in order to get to cruising altitude, um, it's just, they just have a much longer leash. And so I think that that's one of the biggest reasons why I think this time could be different, is that the current market leaders are making the biggest bets on the future, um, which is maybe the best lesson learned from last time. You know, you you saw, you know, you look, look, just look at the stock price of GE between 2000 and 2024. They went through a huge amount of upheaval during that period. But if you look at, you know, Microsoft from 2024 to 2044, maybe it's not going to look as tumultuous. Maybe it's going to look like a much uh, bigger hockey stick because they have the balance sheet to make the investment in data centers and GPUs. They have the balance sheet to hire the Bitcoin mining adjacent firms, whether that's a core scientific, an iron, a hut, whoever they, whoever they end up working with, maybe it's all of them, um, to be able to, to power through what is going to be one, maybe two cycles to see AI reach the masses, reach escape velocity, get integrated into all of the existing products and businesses that they want it to be integrated into. Like AI plus Excel is super obvious. AI plus Microsoft Word, super obvious and should be very, very beneficial. Well, it's, I mean, it's obvious because at the moment we're going to uh, AI websites doing the work, copy and paste and bringing it back. But it, it's happening. Look, MailChimp, when I send an email out, as I'm typing, it will rewrite my headline or whatever. <laughs> uh, Grammarly, I think, has introduced AI. Yep. Pho Photoshop. Photoshop's incredible. A bit weird sometimes, but you can, like, if you, you know, for example, I, I need to produce these images of kits, right? 3D models. Check this out. I'll show you it. So... These go in our pro. These go in our uh, before a game. We have to send this out to um, the opposition team, and uh, and it's a it's a PDF of everything. He needs to include our kits so they know what we're wearing, so they don't match. Yeah. So I go into Mid Journey get to create it, but look for some reason he's added a Adidas badge. I don't want it on there, so I'll go on Photoshop and it'll just get rid of that. But we could do that to get rid of people in images. You yeah. could do it. It's incredible. It, it is the integration is happening. I. I I'm intrigued. I'm almost intrigued to see where are we in 10 years? Because I think the world's going to look very different. But, the, you know, this is this is like what happened to me, at least with the iPhone, is I just turn into a superhero. I have email. I have information. I have phone calls. I have access to the entire internet. I have, you know, I have all of this incredible tooling in my pocket, in my hand. And so I'm... I'm already a superhero with the iPhone. To me, this is just adding like a new superpower. Like I used to be able to fly, but now I also have x-ray vision and super strength. And so you're like adding on more features to your superhero persona. And so like, that's where I think we end up going to, but like, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not very amenable to this idea that like AI is gonna replace all the jobs. I think AI is just gonna create super workers. Yeah, look, it makes us, it, it makes us all more talented. Exactly. I mean, yeah. Or talented for the first time in some cases. But but it do, but but there are sectors that are going to change. That you know, copywriting, design, sure. web design, coding. It's sure, but like there are more people working at bank tellers today than before the ATM was launched. Because yeah, okay, so yeah, so we're coordinators of the AI. Exactly. So yeah. like we like you know we we've we've stopped being the infantry and we've started all being generals. Hmm. Do you um did you check out that? Search GBT, by the way. No, I've not looked at it. Is yet. it live? I You've heard know. about this. It came out yesterday that Chat GBT is about to launch Search GBT. No, I haven't. It's a little bit of a. I've been in conference hall. I'm not sure it's actually launched yet. Did you? What have you Googled? Search GBT. Prototype. Aren't you supposed to search GBT? Search GBT? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, PT? What yeah, is I it? think it is. I don't think it's live yet, but it's coming. Yeah. It's, it's a big threat to Google. Good. Competition produces better outcomes. Good. Fuck you, Google. And they're just going to have the same thing, aren't they? They will. Although I, I mean, I've played with their original AI stuff, and it's uh, their first attempt was it? Was what was it called? Bard. It was called. Yeah, it I wasn't think it's very good. Name. Bard apologized to me for fucking up. <laughs> um, one of the big like pushbacks against Bitcoin mining and AI integration is that it's a distraction from the Bitcoin stuff. What do you think about that? Um, I mean, I'll tell you what the way we're thinking about it at least at CleanSpark thus far, is we're focused on mining more Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, a great business for some operators, but right now 
I think that the opportunity to continue to expand and mine more Bitcoin is more exciting. And wow. until that perspective changes or until different opportunities present themselves, staying focused and staying um, attuned to leading the market on expanding mining operations is the priority. AI is GPUs, whereas Bitcoin mining is ASICs. What is the difference to a normie? How do they understand the difference of what these machines are doing? Um, it's a good question. You know, can I tell you why I'm asking it? Because I'm leading somewhere in that there was a time where you had your ASICs and I remember the first time I bought a bunch of S9s and mined them and the company I use would auto switch between mining Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash or mm -hmm. I don't know what other shit coin uh, and just give you the best revenue you know, at the time. Yep. Is, is there a world where the machines can do the same thing or are they completely different? Completely different. To right. me, it's like, you know, trying to plug your TV into your oven. Right. Right. One of them cooks food. The other one shows you videos. Uh, it's because we started with- appliances. But we started with GPUs on Bitcoin mining. Yeah. So, so it's important to understand, like, what are the machines supposed to do? Yeah. So Bitcoin mining is a very, very narrow, specific computational function. Um. Think about it as like you have an app that just flips a coin, right? That's kind of what an ASIC does. A GPU is more like the iPhone than like a single app. Now, what you if if you tried to use your your GPU to mine Bitcoin, you just would generate like way 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 less comp computational power for the Bitcoin mining specific function. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, it would the 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 difference between GPUs and ASICs is like very very wide. Um, also, the infrastructure required to run GPUs versus ASICs is very different, and the cost uh, per GPU unit of electricity is much higher than an ASIC. So, like, I might be able to buy a megawatt worth of ASICs for between one and two million dollars. If I were to buy one megawatt of GPUs, it's like fifteen to twenty million dollars. And so the way that you monetize one unit of power with one unit of CapEx versus one unit of power with one unit of GPU CapEx, like those, those equations are very different. Um, and so from a capital efficiency perspective, the ASIC still represents a very different return profile than the GPU environment. So that's why you'll see, <clears throat> that's why you'll see a lot of these mining companies, um, cut a deal where their job is to build out the infrastructure, but not necessarily buy or operate the GPU. They'll offload GPU ownership and GPU operations in almost a hosting type of way to someone else. So like if you look at all the Core Weave, Core Scientific deals, Core Scientific's job is to source the power and build the data center but it's not their job to own the, the GPU and operate the cluster. I was gonna say, because my, my next question then was like, if you're Microsoft or Google and you're, you've are you got the balance sheet to invest uh, and you just wanna build out and ensure you get market share, could it be a scenario where they would reach out to a, a, a large miner who has significant power, significant land, probably uh, the skills within the company who can, uh, even though it's a different business, essentially, build up these uh, GPU AI mining. Do you, could they call it mining? What do they call it? Compute. Yeah, AI compute data centers. They've got they've got the skills, the talent, the site, the power. To, would they go to them and say, look, as a service, provide this? I think that's happening. Oh, that's happening. Yeah, so so I think that that's definitely already happening. Um, I want to talk about the skills and the know-how because you can't take a mining technician and transfer him to a AI data ba or uh, AI data center and they'll be able to do the same job day one. There is a pretty significant skill gap between those two functions. There's also a design and construction component as well, which is that if you've got an engineering team that's great at building Bitcoin mines, they're not necessarily great at building AI data centers. They're, they're a pretty different thing. Um, could it just be a case of le lease in the excess power and space? Yeah, so you could you could you could do a land almost like a landlord deal, right? Yeah. Which just includes power and land, and then you hand it off to, you know, in, Nvidia has a great form factor that they're able to build, deploy, and operate. Um, so you could get a little more arm's length. 
those those types of relationships are lower margin. And so then you get into like, is the arm's length CapEx plus margin worth the difference between that AI use case and the CapEx and um, margins achievable through Bitcoin mining? And that's more sort of where I'm landing is that the CapEx know-how and expertise required to run Bitcoin mining at scale and to continue to grow Bitcoin mining delivers higher margin than the AI use case uh, on a risk-adjusted basis. Well, what a business NVIDIA have built. <laughs> oh, my God. Incredible. <laughs> Almost without knowing they were going to build that business. They would, I mean, they started out as graphics cards, basically. Can I, can I show another podcast? Yeah. Um, the There's a podcast called Acquired okay. that did a three-part history of nvidia definitely gonna listen to that. it's did, so good but did did they just start as, as graphics cards like for nerds to play doom so literally it was it was gaming yeah they started with gaming then they got in they built out their integrated um like gpu programming language environment into the chips and then sold that to universities for research basically and then that became like their whole business and they were in all of these university environments and then gpus continued to get more sophisticated with all the different use cases outside of just um university gaming and then it became the data center staple and once you're in the data center environment the integration between the programming language for the gpu and the hardware itself because nvidia gpu NVIDIA native programming language, like that relationship became a big lock-in for all of these data center operators. And so the Amazons and AWS like are just are just fully integrated into this ecosystem. So the same way that your iPhone talks to your laptop is the same way that all of these integrated GPU cluster environments, cloud environments, these become these huge lock-ins where you're upgrading and refreshing all with the same vendor, all with the same software stack, all with the same engineering talent. Um, and and they built just an unbelievable business. Yeah, because I, I, I kind of like vaguely remember a period where the gaming nerds and the Bitcoin nerds were in a like a battle and a fight to get hold of GPUs. Mm -hmm. There just wasn't enough around, was it? Was it like the Ethereum people? I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah. Ethereum mining. Yeah. It, was all the, it was all of the Ethereum miners who were looking for the same GPUs that the the gaming folks were also looking for. And and at the time, you know, this was probably it's like funny. 2017, 18. Um, the GPUs were just cheap. And then they would go through these like shitcoin waves of mining that would drive the prices up like insane. And so you would track the price of GPUs like against the market cap for some of these um, other things. And they would track like one to one. And so the the shitcoin market became the GPU market until AI came to play and the LLMs were released. And then it just became like everything was bid massively, massively high on the GPU side. Wild, wild. We'll definitely check that one out. Mm. Um, okay, moving on from that, you also talked about, well, look, we've done the grid stuff to death. We know be not your grid. energy yeah we know that we know grid integration that's a definitely a mature in part actually we'll touch on it lightly it, it seems like there is wider kind of like awareness from people within the sector it's like oh hold on this is good for our business we talked for the first time in miami in 21 yeah. that was our first podcast and we talked about the grid and flexible load and how does energy get generated transmitted and delivered I stand by 100% of the things we said. And I think that we basically pounded the table on the same topic for three and a half years, and now everybody woke up to it. How wide is that? How, you know, is it is it all states? Is it every part of the grid now knows about this and is interested? Um, not, not everywhere, but I would say we're, we're sort of through, we're through the singularity on it, yeah. where it's a well understood concept now that a flexible demand curve based on price signals and contractual obligations is the way to scale the existing generation at least until more can be built. It's another protection against Bitcoin as well because you know, if there were some over-regulation that 
was existential to Bitcoin. You're going to have the whole energy set to say, hold up, hold up a second here. And, but you can't have it without having decentralization. So you, you've got to, you've got to accept the things about Bitcoin you don't like as a regulator and a e control freak. The, e the easiest way to, to future proof Bitcoin is to make Bitcoin mining a necessity for all of the different power systems all over the country and all over the world. Because you know what people hate more than Bitcoin? Their power bills going up. Yep. And so the only, you know, the only thing less, you know, less popular in some of these places still is inflation and these other economic factors. And so if Bitcoin mining is the reason why their power bills aren't going up, you cannot get rid of Bitcoin mining. What a what an incredible unintended consequence of uh Satoshi creating this decentralized money that you suddenly had this thing that integrates with the grids and makes power. Like, it's just incredible. We don't know that it was unintended. Ooh. Okay, fair. But but it is. Like, the, the relationship, you know, what got me in, ex, you know excited about working, you know, I, I was into Bitcoin before I understood mining. You know, I'm, I'm Bitcoin first, mining second. But what made me take the jump professionally full time was just being excited about the intersection between energy and money. Okay. And what about global expansion? I think it's a huge opportunity. I think that, you know, Bitcoin mining is is like water, right? It runs into the lowest point on the topography. And so, so far as you're able to get Bitcoin mining into the hands of countries that have reasonably robust property law and safety and sufficiently low energy prices, it's going to be a huge expansion opportunity for the existing scaled players and for new entrants and for you know sovereigns as well as we're seeing so when before we started recording we were talking a little bit about texas and you think that it may not be the sort of capital hash rate in the us in five years however long why do you think that is um i just think that texas is pretty saturated there's a huge demand for the power there um they're going to become constraints. I think there's always going to be mining in Texas. I think a free market for power will bring Bitcoin mining to that place, you know, wherever it emerges. Um, that doesn't mean that you're going to put on another 25 gigawatts in Texas and do so at the same price that you got back in 2020 or 2022. Um, so I think there's, you know, I think there's some price risk to a congested place. I think there's some regulatory risk. I think that, you know, the the federal government would love to pull the Texas grid back under its umbrella. Um, we know what Texans would say if we had Marshall on right now. I know what he would say. <laughs> I know what he would say. Um, but I expect that to be a real fight and a real distraction. And there's and there's definitely government interest um, and special interest. You know, you talk about the the fight with the peaker plants that are you know all owned by Berkshire Hathaway. They don't want Bitcoin miners to get access to those demand response dollars. Those are fights that I'm happy to not have. Um, what does it mean we'd never build in Texas? Of course not. We'll build wherever there's opportunity. Um, but I'm glad that we have to fight the fights that are in front of us and not those ones. And so this is Bitcoin mining season two. This is Bitcoin mining season two. But bringing it back to like all of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. it's just I th I feel like we are in Bitcoin season two. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I feel we're there. We're I, I feel. There's just for so many reasons. I I I I worry less and less these days about the existential risk of Bitcoin. I'm more kind of like it's a bit like I just want this to hurry up and get us that next bit. Yeah, we're you know the the things I used to worry about almost don't exist anymore. You know, are we going to get regulated out of existence? Are we going to fail? to broadly distribute the idea and the promise of Bitcoin to people all over the world and all over the country. The ETF is huge. Mm -hmm. um, I just think like the fact that the ETF got through and then it was the most significant ETF launch in history. It's the most successful product that's been out there. Like these are huge, huge wins for the industry. The, the quality, you know, we're seeing, you know, state pensions and, and university endowments like legging into this thing, you know, massively. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, and and obviously the ETF is no replacement for self custody. But being able to put 
the economic value of Bitcoin into a lot of people's hands very, very scalably, very, very easily and liquid, that's that's just hard to overstate. Um, but I think, you know, I think, you know, Bitcoin, the asset is sort of, it's out of the bottle now and there's no, it's not going back in. Um, and so the question is, what do we do to accelerate the timeline? What do we do to continue to bolster the global promise of Bitcoin, you know, spending time with the HRF folks and, you know, Gladstein and CK and Alex Lee and Arsh, like, like seeing what the work that they're doing and what Bitcoin means to those activists all over the world, you know, like that's why we mine. That's why we do this. Um, and so being able to have Bitcoin play a role on the global stage in the most important financial markets in the world and also keep people safe in some of the scariest, most authoritarian situations and do both at the same time mm -hmm. and do both really well, like that's what hyper-Bitcoinization is. Yeah, it's, more, it's people actually doing everything we've spoken about. It's going out there and doing it. <laughs> it's happening. It's integrating it with your businesses. You know, it's software companies integrating Bitcoin with into their businesses. It's Bitcoin becoming an, an uh, option for payment everywhere. It's on all the financial rails. You know, but it requires people to go and actually do it. And just like we've we've spoken about it, we have made eight hundred fifty podcasts about it. Like people have got to get out there and That's actually it? do it. Yeah, is it eight fifty? What's eight yeah, sixty? Yeah, yeah. eight fifty, eight sixty. It's like it's now's now's the time to go and act. Um, I also hope with that, I I think we're going to see a real shift in politics, a real shift, not just politicians themselves shifting, a new wave of Bitcoin native politicians coming in. I think this old, this old world of politics is is breaking. I mean, it's broken in the UK. I mean, we've just got a brand new uh, administration. It's going to be the same shit for four years, and and but I. I genuinely believe that's that's going to functionally change it might be the last thing that has to change because it's it's the thing that 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 can be the most resistant to bitcoin it has the tools to be resistant to bitcoin but and the I, incentive yeah and the incentive but i still think it functionally will break as it is and become something new uh, uh, you know the this this to me is like the final act of the cypherpunks where now you know, we the cypherpunk values began to be talked about in the 90s and won a huge battle for encryption at that time. But that wasn't the end of the fight. The end of the fight was to bring encryption to money and to be able to have a true internet native bearer instrument that's undebasable, unseizable, and uncensorable. And if, if, what cryptography did first was save private communication. What they'll truly be remembered for is saving money. That sounds like a great ending, man. <laughs> Beautiful words for you as ever, Harry. All right, I'm here for it. You good? Yeah, we're good. All right. Thanks, Harry. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank Harry. Thank you, everybody.